Lord, I pray as we open up your word today, you would give us ears to hear what your spirit would say to us, that we could know you a little bit better. Thank you for your word. Thank you for life. Thank you for love. And we give you praise. Amen. <laughs> so this passage, Arise, Shine, for Your Light Has Come, is the last one we looked at out of Isaiah. And the concept is throughout the scripture to where the born-again ones, the new creations in Christ, God's people, uh, receive life and everything begins to change from the inside out. We become new and it changes. And part of what we are told to do is to let our light shine. And this light and darkness contrast, you'll find it all over the scripture. There are those in the kingdom of God that are living and acting and breathing and thinking and valuing differently than those that are in some other kingdom, the kingdom of darkness. And we are in the kingdom of light and there is the kingdom of darkness. And there is a vast difference between the two kingdoms. And so we don't lose sight of that. Isaiah was talking about it here, about letting our light shine. And we spent quite a bit of time talking about that. Those that are outside of the kingdom have a very bleak future in front of them. Uh, this picture to me is a very scary picture in Matthew 8 where Jesus is talking to a group of Israelites and he says, I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. And that is excellent news, that it doesn't matter where you come from, east, west, north, south, Jew, Gentile, believer, male, female, young, old, there is an incredible banquet coming and that's excellent news. But he also throws in, while the sons of the kingdom, the ones that the gospel was first preached to and rejected it, will be thrown into outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What a picture. What a picture of weeping and gnashing of teeth is, is the natural outworking of rejecting God's love is going to be fear and death and torment and darkness. C.S. Lewis says the gates of hell are locked from the inside. They don't want to go out where God is, where the love is. And they say, stay out of here. We want our fear, darkness, bondage, etc. And it's weeping and gnashing of teeth. You know, what a picture. Our future is far better than that. And I'm grateful for that. God's children will have something extremely different. Our, our eternity will consist of light and love and worship and peace and joy and glory and no more heartache and no more tears and no more fear and all those kind of things. And I'm saying, yes! And as you go through and read the rest of Isaiah 60, and I'd encourage you to go back and do so, but I just want to hit a couple high spots as you go through. You pick it up in verse uh, 15. He says, whereas you have been forsaken and hated with no one passing through, I will make you majestic forever, a joy from age to age. Verse 17, instead of bronze, I'll bring gold, and instead of iron, I'll bring silver. Instead of wood, bronze, instead of stones, iron. I will make your overseers peace and your taskmasters righteousness. Violence shall no more be heard in your land, devastation or destruction within your borders. You shall call your walls salvation and your gates praise. The sun shall be no more, your light by day, nor for brightness shall the moon give you light. But the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. Your sun shall no more go down, nor your moon withdraw itself. For the Lord will be your everlasting light, and then your days of mourning shall be ended. Your people shall all be righteous. They shall possess the land forever, the branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I might be glorified. The least one shall become a clan, and the smallest one a mighty nation. I am the Lord. In its time, I will hasten it. What a promise. What a bunch of promises. God is making to a captured, defeated, conquered, in a foreign nation, with nothing, bunch of people. And God says all of these things to them. He says, this is coming. And you're going, wow. How in the world is God going to do all of this? You know they had to hear these things and start getting some expectations. We know they did. Is God going to raise up some supernatural army? Is God going to come in and just wipe everything out and let us have deliverance and march out to freedom? Is He going to resurrect David or Solomon and restore the golden age of Israel? They had this understanding that God was going to bring a Messiah, a deliverer, a messenger, Isaiah said all the time who would come and kick out their enemies, who would defeat their foes, who would set them free. This warrior would destroy the wicked. 
He would come in and establish righteousness. The kingdom of God would be established on earth. And they knew this. It was promised. God himself is going to fight for us. Wow. And they looked forward to this time of victory. But you know, their view was incomplete. The pain of their situation clouded their expectations. When Jesus did come along, some embraced him as Messiah. They fully expected him to do what they had always dreamed. In fact, you remember, they, they went rushing out with palm branches in their hands on Palm Sunday, shouting, Hosanna, Lord, save us to this Messiah. He's the conqueror. They wave these branches fully expecting God to do what Isaiah said he would do, that the messenger would come, that he would do all of these things. But all their expectations, while true, were too limited. They really were too limited. Jesus would defeat their enemies, but not the Romans. He was going to defeat sin and death. Justice would be established. It will flow down. It will make all the wrongs right. But not in this world. Not in this lifetime. The relationship that matters was this one. And Jesus would do what was necessary to get that straight. To where he who didn't know any sin, had never sinned, wasn't sin, would become sin so that we could become righteous and restored with God. Jesus came and said, the kingdom of God is here. And they had all these expectations. And while they were true, they were too narrow. <laughs> they were too small. Their, their, their view was limited by what they were suffering, what they were going through. That smallness limited the vision that they had. God was dealing with eternal matters. They were focused on temporary ones. Does it sound familiar in your life, in my life? I can get so caught up with what's in front of me that I miss what God is doing and has done. And the things that matter. God and God alone is the only one who understood what he was doing completely. And from eternity past, he had the reconciliation and, and what was going to take to get things right between him and his creation. Jesus was going to go to the cross. He was going to die. Isaiah saw some of it. And we read about the things that, that are going to happen someday. You're trapped in darkness, you can be in light. You're, you're trapped in sin, you will be set free. Right. You're living under the shadow of death. Death is a doorway now to life, an eternal life. The sting is gone of death and so forth. So you read through Isaiah 60 and you get to that, and, and then you get to Isaiah 61. And he says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Does that sound familiar to you? Have you read that before somewhere? Jesus, when he comes back from the desert after being tempted by the Spirit, goes into Nazareth. Luke has it in chapter 4 of his, of his uh, accounting of it. And he sits down in the, in the synagogue and either hand him the scroll or he asks for the scroll and he finds Isaiah and he opens it up and he reads that passage. He reads that very passage. And then he says this. He rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eye of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Wow! Can you imagine? What a claim. <laughs> I am that messenger. I am the Messiah that has come. Go, wow. Did he really mean that? Absolutely. <laughs> of course he did. You break this section down of what Jesus read and what Isaiah wrote. He says, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. And we know that's true in Jesus. We know it was prophesied back in Isaiah 42 where he says, Behold my servant whom I am uphold my chosen and whom my soul delights. I've put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. We know that Jesus returned in the power of the spirit to Galilee after he was tempted and did battle with the devil, and we've got that recorded there, and he defeats him, and he comes into the, into the city full of the Spirit's power. We know the Spirit was seen coming down on Jesus at his baptism. The voice from heaven talking. We know the Spirit resided on Jesus through his entire life as he raised the dead, and he healed the blind, and he cured the sick, and he changed the world, and is still changing the world through the words that he spoke. 
Even the people that, that don't follow Him will readily acknowledge that His teaching was out of this world. <laughs> that it was the greatest example of what human intellect or teaching could do. And you're going, okay, whatever. He claimed to be God. He was or He wasn't. You, know, you, can't, you can't get off on that. But even they recognize that His words were something different. <laughs> It's under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. He went around doing the works that God had him to do. And so the Spirit was upon him. And he says, because the Lord has anointed me. Anointed is, is what they used to do in the old days. I mean, we pray for people and we put a little dab on their forehead with oil and that's okay. But back in the day, that's not how they did it. What they would do is they would take a flask of oil and they would pour it on your head and it would run down your head and it would run down your beard and it would go all over your clothes. Now, we don't do that here. and That's probably good, but... What it symbolized with this was the Spirit of God being poured out in abundance and starting at the head and running down and making its way to the heart. It was anointed with power. And he says, because the Lord has anointed me, the Spirit is upon me and has empowered me and quickened me and anointed me to do something. And what was it beyond the works that was there? It was to make an announcement to the poor, the downcast, the brokenhearted, the good news. In the New Testament, when this is translated in Luke, it's the word we use for gospel. The good news is what Jesus has come to proclaim. Our gospel is an announcement. It's not a set of rules and regulations. We tend to think of Christianity sometimes as a set of rules and regulations, but that's not what the gospel is. What the gospel is is an announcement of what God has done. This is what has been done to take care of the problem you have, which is sin and death. And I have come and beat all of it. And now I rule and reign, and you can too. It's an announcement of what has gone on. And as heralds, you and I proclaim that. We don't sit there and say, clean up your act. We say, go to the cross and fall on your face before a loving God. The poor or afflicted need to hear good news. And without Christ, that's who we are. What's the good news? Well, how about this? You can have freedom. You can have complete healing. You can have total love and peace without measure. You can have anything and everything you ever imagined in your wildest dreams and more. Really? Yeah, but not, not here, not fully, not completely. But through Jesus Christ, isn't that what we're promised for eternity? I mean, isn't that what we're promised? Never ending peace, joy, life, etc., you don't get it all here, but wouldn't you rather have short-term pain, suffering, heartache, issues, deprivation, whatever, uh, no, in order to have eternal life and gain and all those kind of things? I mean, think about just as parents. We understand as parents that our children don't think very long-term. Sometimes it's like 30 seconds or a minute. They're not thinking about the consequences or they're not thinking about something that, that could happen or is going to happen or whatever. And we as wise parents step in there and understand that there are times when we have to either inflict or have inflicted on them short-term pain, think doctors and whatnot, in order to accomplish long-term goals. Or there are times when we say no because this is not in your best interest. You cannot just sit and consume all this junk. You can't. It's going to ruin your dinner. It's going to make your teeth rot. You know, you're going to have problems. But I want it now. You know. As a loving parent, we step in and we put boundaries and we put restraints because we're looking longer term, aren't we, most of the time? We're saying there's better ahead. And so, yeah, I know this is a short-term problem here or short-term pain or even a short-term no, but the future is going to be great and going to be good. And our Father does that, except our good, good Father knows everything. Yeah. And He knows the perfect answer to every one of our situations and needs. He knows all of the ramifications of all of it. I don't. I certainly don't. He knows what we need perfectly. He knows what we don't need. He knows what would destroy us if we got it. And we could be begging God for something and God says, no, it's not my will for you. Does that mean he doesn't love us or does that mean he loves us with a knowledge way beyond what you and I have? We could be begging God to do something. God says, that is not what I have for you. Isn't that what parents do? I like the way Paul put it here. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal way to glory beyond all comparison. 
this light momentary affliction. And whatever we're going through, compared to eternity, it's light and it's momentary. Didn't we sing about your eternal were a vapor? 70, 80, 100 years on this earth is a whoosh in light of eternity. It just is. Paul said, I know a man, whether he was in this body or in the spirit, out of the spirit, I don't know. And maybe people argue about whether it was him or not. And I, it doesn't matter to me. But he said he was caught up into the third heaven and he saw things that it's not even permitted for men to talk about or to know or to understand. Do you think that that man would ever worry again about this life? Do you think he would ever have a care again about this life, if seeing those things? He saw things that, that are just amazing. We get a glimpse of it through Revelation. We get a glimpse of it now and again when the heavens are pulled back and we see this other reality, and we believe it by faith. This man saw it. Hmm. By the way, the, the context of Paul saying that is the one that says, so we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. We don't lose heart. Yeah. I never really related to this verse till I passed 60. <laughs> and, and you start realizing that your outer man stinks sometimes. <laughs> it's just falling apart. And we're all in various degrees of that, but we don't lose heart. And you can apply that to any situation in your life. We don't lose heart because these momentary light afflictions are producing an eternal Way to glory beyond anything we can even comprehend here. And comprehend here. And part of that eternal promise, I think I said it wrong both times. Yeah, anyway. Part of the promise, he sent me to heal, bind up the brokenhearted. Wow. I've got good news for you today. Beyond physical pain, if you're in here in emotional pain, if you're in here with a broken heart, Part of the Messiah's ministry was to announce good news to you that you can have a whole heart. Your heart can be healed. To bind up the broken hearted. None of us get out of this life without pain and suffering. If you haven't had much in your life, you're probably not old enough yet. But we will all go through pain and heartache and difficulty. It's just the way it is in this life. And our hearts can get broken. But I've got these promises from God. The Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and He will guide them to springs of living water. And what's going to happen there? God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. I've sat there and pondered about this, and I said, how? Are we just going to forget everything? I mean, there are things that just hurt and make you want to cry. And I, I can't imagine that God's going to do a memory wipe when we get up there, and we're just going to forget everything. That doesn't seem right. But something's going to happen to where God explains it to us or we see the big picture or whatever, and all of a sudden we're going, yeah, that's right. And the tears get wiped away. He says it again later on. He says, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. Why? Well, the former things have passed away. The old things, the old tears has passed away. The pain that dominates our life and heart now is not always going to be there. And I'm not downgrading the pain or belittling it. But Jesus Christ promised <laughs> that this would happen and he cannot lie. And so there is a day coming when all of that brokenheartedness will be healed, will be restored, will be set free. Jesus stepped into this life in the midst of a bunch of broken, suffering, dejected, social outcast type people Blind, lepers, death, disease, conquered, all of that. And he spoke life and he spoke light and he healed many of them and he restored many of them. We can be free from that stuff, even today. God will heal us. He will set us free. What? I mean, all of, the, all of those people, by the way, ended up dying again. We know that. But what a foretaste of eternity. Can you imagine, Lazarus? Our brother stood up and talked about some of the, the miracles there. Can you imagine what that was like for him to come hopping out of the, out of the hole in the ground? And the joy and the excitement and all of that. I mean, that's just a foretaste of what eternity is going to be like. Lazarus died again. We know that. He's not around here today. But 
It's a foretaste. And what's the last thing he says? The Spirit's upon me. The Lord's anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Beyond having our hearts healed emotionally and, and getting that brokenheartedness taken care of, and beyond the, 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 the good news where we're going, okay, good news, that's great, he says you can be set free. You could be set free from prison, prison of, of, of lust and anger and bitterness and hate and fear and doubt and worry and habitual addictions. You can be set free because the Messiah has come and he said, I am doing this to announce good news to you that you don't have to be captive anymore. I have opened the jail cell. I've got a picture of Jesus standing in front of my cell and I'm in there and I'm, in, I'm clutching to my anger or my bitterness or whatever it is I'm holding on to. And Jesus opens the door and he says, you are free, walk out. I'll give you a robe of righteousness. Put it on, leave that old stenchy, dirty, nasty jail cloth thing behind. Put on my robe of righteousness and walk on out the door, click. Let go of that. I'm going, okay. <laughs> I got to get up and I got to walk out the door. And I drop that, that stuff that has me, and I walk out free. Isn't that what it says? To set the captives free. You can get out of prison today. You don't understand. I've been dealing with this my whole life. I struggle with this. I, 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 I deal constantly with it. We can be set free in Christ. Amen. What is the power of God? I mean, is it limited? Everybody else can be set free but you. Your sin is too great. Your bondage is too deep. Really? Not to my God, not to the one Kurt was talking about. It's slung out the universe out there. Not to that God. <laughs> he came to proclaim liberty. We can be set free. If you're holding on to your stuff now in your prison, you're doing it with an open door in front of you. Let it go. Drop it and walk out the door. Freedom is there. He's done it all. This is good news. <laughs> And Jesus says, I've come to proclaim good news. That's part of it. I've come to deal with your sin. I've come to deal with death. I've come to deal with your brokenheartedness. I've come to deal with your addictions and your, and, your, and your problems and your prison. And I've come to proclaim liberty to you. Will you walk out that door? Will you do it? God, help me. <laughs> Safe in here. I'm comfortable in here. I like this. Let me just stroke whatever it is that I have. He says, let it go and walk on out with me. Will we do it? It's a good question. So let me ask you some questions as we wrap this up. Where are you today? Are you in light or in darkness? How do you know? How do you know if you're in light or darkness? You should know, but do you? Where are you today? Are you a child of God or are you not? Have you been born again or have you not? If you have not been born again, you are still a child of darkness. You're still in the kingdom of darkness. If you are a child of God, you have been translated into the kingdom of light. And we can walk in that light. So where are you today? What are you walking in? What are you holding on to? Where am I? Am I walking in the light or something less than that? Am I embracing life or something less than that? Am I getting... Where am I? Where are you? Important questions. Are you seeking to understand the gospel at a deeper level, the good news? I hope so. The more you spend thinking about the cross of Jesus Christ and all of the things that happened there for the believer, and, and all of it points back to that. Paul, who was a very learned man, learned man, said, I have purposed to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Why? Because when we focus on that and what has happened to us, our minds will be renewed. I am free at the cross. I'm empowered at the cross. I'm a new creation in Christ through what happened on the cross. I'm in a covenant relationship with God my Father because of the cross. Wow. So what are you doing with it? I hope that you're seeking to understand it better. See, we can get familiar with the terms and just not press in. I pray we would. So is your heart broken today? Are you in here with a broken heart? How do you get it healed? The messenger, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, Son of God, second person of the Trinity, said, I will heal your broken heart. How do you do that? How do you get there? How do you move to that? How does that heart get healed? 
How does it get restored? Did Jesus lie? Or is it the truth? What are you going to do with it? What are you going to believe? These are important questions, I think. Most of us go through life and run into traumatic events. The, the, the truth is, behind most atheists, you will find a hurt, a wound. Someone died, God let them down, God didn't do what they thought he should do, and they get mad. <laughs> How can he be a good God when this happened? Fill in the blank. What is that? That's a broken heart. How do you get that broken heart healed? Through Jesus Christ. It's the only way. You're not going to fix it with anything else. But if you're in here today with a broken heart, how do you get it put back right? It's a good question to explore. My final question is, are you in a prison of sin? Are you bound up today? Is there something that you just won't let go of? You know, we, we always tend to think of you know, the biggies. But what about bitterness? What about unforgiveness? What about holding on to hurts and wounds? What about holding on to anxiety, fear, doubt, worry? What about worry? <laughs> Is worry a sin? <laughs> It'll keep us in a dungeon. What about your kids? We parents tend to obsess over our kids and them walking with God and, and worried about something happening, happening to them or being hurt or being you know, harmed in somehow. And, and I, don't know. I mean, we can just get in a dungeon, a prison over this. There's lots of different things we can do. And yet I still have that picture of Jesus standing there and he said, I have opened the door. I have proclaimed liberty. Will you walk out of your prison? Will you drop what you're clinging to? Will you let go of the pornography, the anger, the bitterness, the lust, whatever it is that has you bound? Will you drop it and let it go and walk into freedom? What a choice. What a call. Will you let go of fear? Will you let go of worry? Which one of you in here can add a single hour to your life by worrying? Isn't that what Jesus said? You can't turn one of your hairs gray. You've done a great job. You didn't have any choice. It wasn't through worry. Can we change anything? Lord have mercy. So I'm praying that God you would speak to us. You would speak to our hearts as we go back and think about these things through the week. As we think about the songs that were sung today. The, the words that were shared in the prayer time. And, and these scriptures that I've shared today Lord. I pray you would speak to us. And I'm so grateful that you, we have the promise of eternal life. No more tears, no more heartache, no more sickness, no more death. But light and glory and love, we won't need a sun, we won't need a moon, we'll have you. And God, I don't begin to understand what all that means, but I can't wait. And I'm so thankful for your promises that are true. And God, I thank you for your word that renews our mind, that gives us hope when we are staring into a hopeless situation. There is a different perspective. There's yours, and yours is right, always. And yours is complete. And I pray we would adopt yours and not ours. And when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, when we go through the issues of this life, encountering the storms and the heartaches, Lord, we'd go to you through your word, and we'd get our minds renewed and our hearts restored. And I thank you, Lord, that today, it is possible for us to walk in freedom. If we came in here today all bound up, we can walk out of here free. We can begin anew today, and I thank you for that. That your promises are yes and amen. And that when we come to you, you'll forgive our sins, you'll cleanse us, you'll renew us. When we come to you and we're beat down and we're heavy laden, we can leave them there and find rest. And on and on it goes through your word of what you've promised you would do for us. Lord, may we be those that do that, beginning today. And Lord, if there's somebody here today or somebody who'll listen to this later that doesn't know you, I pray, God, they would meet you and cry out to you, that they could hear the good news announced in their life, forgiveness of sin, redemption. You can live a meaningful life. However many days we have, we can live a life that matters because of who it is we serve, who it is that's in us. Thank you so much for that. 
Lord, I pray you'd bless your people as we go about the rest of this day with the men's meeting, with the fellowship we'll have. Lord, I pray that life would come forth, that you would be exalted. And I thank you for it, Father. Amen.